Don't we own our bodies? So why is sex work illegal? Boxers make money with their bodies. Football players do. If someone wants to use their body to make money, why isn't that their choice? This week, my interview is with, shh, a sex worker. People who are joining, can you see? Ayla's made a lot of money, mostly by camming, doing this, talking with men online and performing for them for tips. I present to you two fine breasts. She's also worked as an escort, in other words, a high-end prostitute, a whore lord, she calls herself. Ayla's a libertarian, and like most of us libertarians, she doesn't think sex work should be illegal. But of course, in most of the United States, it is. It's banned in the name of protecting women. So I asked Ayla about that. People say people like you are exploited. It just feels like unfair to me. Did you never have to work a terrible job? A lot of sex workers make significantly more money than they would otherwise. What's your background? I was raised pretty religious, fundamentalist, evangelical, homeschooled, uh, pretty isolated from the outside world. I was expected to be a housewife, good Christian woman. I wasn't allowed to email my friends without going through my parents' emails so that they could read everything I was doing. So you escaped when you were 17. Yep. Yeah. I left home, just got the hell out of there and then tried to make it on my own in life. Ended up working at a factory for about a year, which was really not pleasant. I don't recommend it. Working on the assembly line floor, like on the assembly line, putting things together. So instead... I got into sex work, basically camming. So after working at the factory for a while, I was like, it was really unpleasant. I was like, okay, after this, I want anything that where I'm my own boss. Like, I don't want to work for anybody else. Again, This that was terrible. I, I need to do something more in life. I don't want to be a factory line worker for 10 years. A lot of my coworkers had been there for a very long time. So I just like desperately tried a whole bunch of things and they all kind of failed because I had been homeschooled, right? And like the cultural gap between like a homeschooler and everybody else is like pretty large. It felt like I was speaking a different language than anybody else. I didn't really understand how to connect with them. Um, so eventually, uh, sex work fell onto my lap. Somebody was like, have you ever tried camming? People don't always know what camming is. Explain. Yeah, camming is like uh, you live stream your webcam and people can watch you and they can like type uh, to you in a collective chat room. And you can respond to them like, hey, XOXO, it's nice to see you again. And they'll type like, hello. And then they can send you tips through the chat. Um, for in exchange for you to do stuff. So you can be like, well, I'll take off my shirt if you tip me 20 tokens. And then they do that. You take off your shirt and now you have a little bit of money. I love that you guys still want to see my boobs. How much money? I eventually ended up making around $200 an hour, which was great. Um, most people make a little bit less than that. And then what happened? Well, I did that for a long time. Uh, and it, it's, it was a really fun job. I was very grateful for it uh, because at least this was like something that I owned. Like I could decide if this was like what kind of things I wanted to do, what my limits were. I could decide how many hours I wanted to work. Like I could be creative about it. I could be like ingenious. Thank you guys for the tips you give. And figure out different market. Like, it was all so much under my control that it was like really satisfying. Um, but I did this for about five or six years and eventually kind of burned out. A lot of people would say, what do you mean it's a fun job? It's disgusting. You're performing for dirty old men. And how is that fun? Sometimes that's fun. Right? I was like really scared about camming before I did it. But then once I tried it, I was like, oh, this is fine. And I'm making money. Like when I was working at the factory, that was a thousand times worse. But like nobody cared about that. They weren't like, oh, are you okay? Like, oh, that's so like terrible and horrible. In parts of Nevada and in many European countries, sex work, including prostitution, is legal. Women openly advertise themselves in store windows. There's definitely countries in which it's better. Ideally, we want full decriminalization. Just like, just don't tell us what we can or can't do with our own bodies is the important part. And at some point while this was happening, you became a libertarian. Yeah, I've actually been a libertarian for a very long time. Yeah, since I was a teenager, really. Meet Ayla, a former factory worker who never graduated college. She became one of the most successful performers on the adult subscription site OnlyFans. I learned about Ayla because I happened to see this interview she did with Reason TV's Liz Wolf. But Ayla is also known for using her giant platform to spread hot libertarian takes, such as declaring, I like capitalism. I think generally most of what the government does should be privatized. I'm not sure exactly when it formed, but I just knew that freedom was really important, like bodily autonomy. And it's just, it's just felt like it's always made sense to me ever since then. You did camming and then you did escort work. Yes. Sort of like prostitution. It's just a high 
class word for it. It's a high class word for, for prostitution. Yeah, I was a prostitute. And you liked escorting. Yeah. I remember going in, I was really nervous about it. Like this is always something that like was a desperate thing that people did, or, you know, you get like really stigmatized or it like messes you up psychologically. And I remember like going into my first appointment, feeling really nervous. And then it was actually like a lovely experience. It was like a lovely person. I had a really good time. And then I left with like a bunch of money in my pocket. And I was like, this was awesome. Like what the-? I felt really lied to by society. I was like, nothing bad happened. And I had a good time. I hate everybody for telling me that this was going to mess me up. And like, to be clear, some people do have an emotionally hard time with it. Like if it, you do, like I, I recommend you definitely like reevaluate your priorities if you're considering escorting. But for a lot of us, like me, I was fine. I really liked it. Sometimes you did have a physically hard time with it. Yeah. Like the person who assaulted me, you mean? Just once it happened? Yeah, it was just once and it was because I messed up screening. That was it. The, uh, there's a whole screening process that you do to check your clients to make sure that they're safe. And I just like, there was like some mix up with like which name I had screened and hadn't. And like that one guy happened to be the one. So so if I had done my screening properly, it would be totally fine. Screening is very effective. And how, how do you screen? You can do it different ways. There's lots of different things that girls do. But for me, I required like two references from previous escorts. So if they'd seen other girls, they would give me their emails and I would email those girls and be like, did this guy be chill? And they'd be like, yes, this guy did be chill. And then I'd be like, cool. And I'd see him. Or if he didn't have references, I would require proof of employment um, and a background check basically. And proof of employment was to make sure he's not a cop and a background check to make sure he's not going to like beat me up or something. And then you moved on more to something called OnlyFans. Explain that. So pandemic hit. A lot of my clients are older. I didn't want to accidentally kill any of them with COVID. So I went to OnlyFans. Yeah. Um, which is an online platform, kind of like a, like a Facebook, but if you had to pay to be friends with somebody and then they just posted sexy stuff on their feeds. So it's just a new form of camming. Uh, yeah, it's it's but it's asynchronous. So camming is live. You broadcast live and then you're sort of done. Whereas like OnlyFans, you can post, you can schedule posts in the future. You never have to broadcast live. Um, and a lot of it is done with like texting the people um, also asynchronously. I've read that you say 37,000 sex workers are trafficked. What do you mean by that? It sounds like a big number, but when you put it in scale of the total population, it's actually quite small. And it's significantly smaller than what a lot of people would guess if you say that like there's sex trafficking. If you ask what percentage of sex workers do you think are sex trafficked, a lot of people who are really concerned about it would say something like, I don't know, like 40% or whatever, but it's, it's much closer to 3%. No one really knows. And I'm skeptical of a 37,000 estimate. A lot of reporting about so-called sex trafficking is just wrong. Thousands of children are raped every day. 77-year-old billionaire Robert Kraft is accused of committing a sex act at a spot. Remember when the New England Patriots owner was caught in a sex trafficking sting? The police said the women at the spas were lured into the sex trade. The media said the women were forced. Who were forced into sex slavery. But now Kraft's prosecutors concede there was no trafficking. 99% of the headlines are not true. In one of our earlier videos, Reason reporter Elizabeth Nolan Brown explained. Sex trafficking and prostitution are just sort of used interchangeably. They say we rescued these women and by rescue, they put them in jail and give them a criminal record. The victims are the sex workers themselves who are getting harassed and, um, you know, locked up in cages by the cops. Trafficking is a real problem. Politicians claim people who choose sex work are really sex slaves. Right now, almost 300,000 American children are at risk. The 300,000 children. 300,000. But that number was disavowed by its authors. This is just a total bullcrap number. But people kept using it. 300,000 kids a year are raped. Involuntary sex trafficking does happen. And even one case is horrible. But we'd be better able to fight that if sex work were legal. If it were legal, people could go to the cops and complain about that. Yep. Yeah if, it, yeah, if it really will be a lot safer. If it were decriminalized, it would be a lot safer, to be clear. I, I've been assaulted during in-person sex work before, and it was, wasn't an option in my mind to go get, uh, like, the authorities' help. I, can't, I couldn't. We're here to rescue people that need to be rescued. This is an odd profession in that both left and right are often opposed. Some conservatives who generally support free speech say only hams is harmful. 
YouTuber Carl Benjamin. It seems like it's sort of like a, an online artificial girlfriend service. That's not good, is it? You know, that's that's pretending to have an intimate relationship with thousands of different men. It's awful how OnlyFans has turned. It's commodified being a girlfriend. <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> It's kind of nice how it's commodified having a girlfriend, I think. Podcast host Will Witt. Now you have a completely screwed up society because of this. Yep, it's yep. really upsetting because porn addiction and all of that is something that affects millions of people. Yep. And it's one of the leading causes of divorce, like money and porn. I think he might have his causality a little bit reversed there. What do you mean he has his causality reversed? You think like like porn use is the thing that causes like a divorce, but like often like an unhappy marriage is the thing that causes porn use. I mean, it can. Often porn use is like very healthy regardless of the relationship. And is there something bad about porn use? I don't think so. I, I view it kind of like alcohol. Like it, it, you can have a really good relationship with it. Like it can help like you hang out with your friends and have a great time and form wonderful memories. But it, like if you like really... Uh, get in, out of balance of it in your life, it can have damaging effects. And I view porn kind of similarly. Like, it's not the thing inherently that is bad. It's like the way that you use it. A complaint from the left. Internet pornography is a new form of old patriarchal injustice. It's an interesting um, tactic to, uh, like, if you have like a bunch of good values that you like, and then you have something that you don't like that is supportive of those values, like free speech, then you have to make sure that like, oh, well, that, that, that thing isn't actually covered by my value. That thing's not really free speech. Uh, that, that way, like, it's no longer protected, right? Uh, so I think it's just that sort of tactic, like moving it out from the umbrella. She goes on to say, Name it for what it is, the exploitation of women hidden in plain daylight under the banner of a career choice. Like, I, where was she when I was working at a factory, man? Like, when was she like, oh, no, like, there's the exploita exploitation of women, uh, women, like, working 55-hour weeks with no sunlight. Like, where was she then? I'm like, now I have my own life. I make actually good money. I have a ton of spare time to do what I want. And now people are concerned about my exploitation. I'm like, it just feels, like, unfair to me. Like, like were these people, did you never have to work a terrible job? Like, do you, or I, I kind of just assume that these people like always just had college available to them or like were born to like higher class or elite uh, cultures where their life was very easy. And, but if your life is really hard, then sex work is important. It's really important. And I don't understand that. Today, you sometimes do sex work, but say you're mostly retired. Just a little bit on the side, like really not that often. It's mostly sort of like a fun thing at this point. If someone pays you $20,000 a day. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Where is sex work going? What's next? Yeah, I don't know. I, my guess is that we are going towards like greater freedom around sex work. Like I know that there's a lot of pushback, but I think the pushback is popping up because there is momentum, like because there's this greater push for sex worker acceptance. Uh, so I'm like really hopeful. Maybe I'm too optimistic. I don't know. There might be a couple like swings back and forth. But I think overall, if we're like fast forward 50 years, we'll see like far greater acceptance of sex work at that point. There's a push for more acceptance from where? Oh, sex workers. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, like, I think there's this, this sort of cultural swing that sort of is being a little bit more honest about, like, what female sexuality, the impacts that has. Uh, like, a joke is that, like, a wife is just a prostitute. It's just very long term, like, and you have one client. Uh, and I think that this is kind of true. A lot of people, like, use their sexuality, like, for sugaring, sugar daddies, or sort of this like transactional style relationship. There's a spectrum of types of relationships people can have and like full on prostitution is just one end, but there's like a lot of other points along the way. And those things I think are becoming a little bit normalized. Like we see this in uh, uh, like um, music videos, for example, uh, 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 uh. or like the way that girls like talk about like, oh, well, I'll just find a daddy to like pay for a little bit of stuff while I'm going through college. We're seeing a lot more of that. Four years ago, Congress passed the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, FOSTA. So this may close some websites. They make it easier for a website to be sued. Yeah, it, it did close some websites. I know that people wanted it to help, but in practice, it just made it that like tools sex workers use to do screening um, and to keep themselves safe, like had to go offline or move to different countries or like really hide. 
uh, which is pretty unfortunate. One reason Ayla rarely does sex work today is that she got another job offer. I uh, got funded to do research full time, basically. So I'm an independent researcher and I just work, stare at data sets all day. Uh, I got a lot of followers when I was doing online sex work. I became like really popular. And this means that you have access to a lot of horny men will, will do what you tell them to do. And so if you tell them to take surveys, you can get a lot of data. You're also popular on social media. Cumulatively, I have about a million followers um, across platforms. 350,000 followers on Reddit and coming up on 200,000 followers on FetLife and 170 on TikTok. What the heck is FetLife? I've never ever heard of that. It's a fetish website. Now you're taking these interesting online polls, most of them, not all, about sex. What have you learned? A lot of stuff. <laughs> I have like a database of like 3,000, maybe 500 questions that I've asked online. And I also do like pretty large scale surveys. I just recently did a survey that has, I think, 30,000 respondents, each of them answering for about a thousand data points. So it's really massive amount of data. But usually it's anything I'm like kind of curious about. I'm really curious about the ways that like our moral intuitions don't line up. And I want to like sort of poke at things that like, like make people feel like really confused about what they believe. One example. Have you ever worked a job that caused permanent or long-term damage to your body? 34% said yes. Yeah, it's true. Uh, jobs are often like really hard on people. They're like really terrible. Uh, and yeah, like uh, less than 34% of women doing sex work have had damage to their bodies from that. It's probably less traumatic for an attractive older female teacher to have sex with a 14-year-old boy than an older male teacher to have sex with a 14-year-old girl. 58% said it's less traumatic. But you're not allowed to say that in journalism. Oh, not at all. It's just so fascinating. Because it's like such an indication that like trauma is culturally informed, right? Like if we tell people, like if we expect something to be really traumatic for someone, uh, that that sort of makes it traumatic for someone. And I think that this is really like exemplified with that particular question. Like if you have the exact same action that happens to like a little boy and a little girl, uh, we consider it to be more traumatizing for one of them. And like, why is that? I think it's the story. The 14 year old girl is more traumatized. Why isn't it reasonable to have a double standard in the law? Because like trauma is like really non, not the same. Like for example, uh, women back in like the forties or something, if you ask them, like a man calls at you when you're walking by, I forget the exact study, but they asked, asked people like for a list of examples of like types of behavior men could do. And they asked like, would you find this offensive or nice? And then the women like in the forties, like generally found it nice. And if you ask women the same questions today, they find it really offensive. And so the amount that we don't like a thing can change based on on basically culture. And so I'm not sure if you want to take something that's so culturally changeable and embed that into law. Like what if in 50 years, like we just kind of get over the whole trauma or, or boys start to actually experience more trauma. Uh, do we just update the law? Like, how do we measure this? Uh, there are a lot of laws that I agree are not quite fair, but we don't have a better option because we don't know how to actually in practice, make it fair to people. If scientists who want to create human Zs, a hybrid between humans and chimps, be legally allowed to do so, 75% said no. Yeah. Yeah. If they want to, it's going to happen anyway in secret. And here people are voting that it shouldn't be allowed. I have like very confused feelings about this one. I think people are worried that you're going to create something that has like a really low quality of life, like a human Z. Uh, and it seems like reasonable to not want to create things with a very low quality of life. Like people in Iceland, you just in general abort people with Down syndrome. Um, and I'm not sure like that might be the same kind of mentality here. Have you ever felt like someone truly understood you? Most people say no. It's kind of sad. Isn't that crazy? It's also interesting how people interpret like truly understand. My guess is that they're like answering for some sense of like, have you ever like really felt seen or do you still feel this like yearning? Like you're still trying to have someone like stare directly onto your soul. What's your answer? Wow. Why am I not prepared for that? Um, truly understood me. Uh, yeah, I think I have that now in my spouse. Oh, that's so nice. Congrats. As an escort, I imagine some men said, oh, only you truly understand me. Actually, I don't think so. I have had like why you uniquely understand me. And I've had very special connections with some of them, yeah.
Which of the following present the biggest threat to humanity? Climate change, nuclear war, artificial intelligence, a drug-resistant disease. They were pretty close, but climate change, which upsets me because I don't think it's that big a threat, came in first. It's pretty visceral right now. Uh, I personally am on the AI train. I think AI is very scary. How will artificial intelligence threaten us? If you have like a really super intelligence, uh, that's, it's really hard to make it align with the interests of humanity. And if you have a mild uh, general intelligence that can self-modify, it's going to like very easily self-modify into being very, very intelligent. So I think it's like pretty high chance that that's going to happen. They'll be smarter than we, and maybe they'll decide they don't need us anymore. Most likely, it's going to be a very alien mind. It's going to be like a mind that is completely unlike a mind that we've encountered before. And that's scary because it's like it might make choices that have no sense to us whatsoever. Do women have systemic privilege due to their gender? Well, 83% said yes. To be fair, my audience is like a little bit like red pilled in this direction. Um, but yeah. Your audience is mostly men. Like 88% men or something. Do you think women have an advantage? Oh yeah. <laughs> that, like a systemic privilege means like something that's like ingrained in the system where women generally have better outcomes than men. And like, I, we're already seeing this with college degrees, right? Women are earning a higher percentage of college degrees right now. That's just like one example out of many. Taxation is closer to the price of a good society or theft. This is the libertarian argument. Taxation is theft. But two thirds of your audience said, no, it's the price of a good society. And to be fair, I gave like not very good options for that. It was like kind of like two extremes in a way. Um, but yeah, mo I think most people think it's closer to the price of a good society. And this libertarian agrees with that, actually. I think you got to pay some taxes. Question is how many? I'm just picking the ones I found interesting. You have a lot of these polls. If you're female, do you find it unsexy when a guy verbally asks for consent? And now I'm learning in colleges, the guy is always supposed to verbally ask for consent. It was pretty split among women. Some said, no, still sexy. Many said unsexy. But has it really changed the way people approach women? I think so. Absolutely. Uh, like I, I'm also like pretty in, you know, like sex positive scenes, like, you know, sex parties or something. And, and also like talk to a lot of men who like talk to me about, you know, their attempts dating women and consent is very much, especially in like more liberal cultures, uh, which I've tended to be hanging out in is like very predominant right now. Men are like pretty afraid of doing anything sexually without asking for consent. When I was young, the idea was you're supposed to approach the woman and she often will sort of say, oh no, but it was understood that you were expected to to keep trying and you often succeeded that way and nobody complained. Nobody called that force. Right. Yeah. I think this is just like a changing of what meaning is, right? Like, like uh, there it wasn't considered force because it was sort of like this undercurrent of like understanding. Like when I say no, this doesn't actually mean no. Like when I resist, this is like actually an invitation. Um, and now resistance no longer means actually an invitation, at least in general, culturally, in some areas, right? Uh, so, like, it's just like the symbols for what people are trying to communicate are like changing in the same way that language changes. And it's a, probably a good thing. I think that this does result in uh, fewer instances of people uh, actually resisting and not wanting it and having that overrun. Do you believe it's racist to sexually like one race over another? Like, I'm really into black girls. 85% said no. That's correct. Which is nice. People don't have control over what they're attracted to. You created a graphic for the idea that rape is on a spectrum. And I found this interesting because obviously at the very bottom, a stranger forcibly assaults someone who fights back the entire time. But there were some odd in-between categories. Talk about that. I got the idea for doing this when I had a friend come to me and like give me like described a scenario that she had just been in with a boy and was like very confused whether or not this was rape. Like cause some people were telling her that it was rape, but it didn't feel like rape. So I was like, okay. So I made I made a whole bunch of scenarios and I asked people to rate them on a spectrum, like how much would you class this to be rape? And I took the average ratings for all of them. So a lot of them were like, 
uh, like a 16 year old eagerly has sex with like a 26 year old or like a wife has sex with a husband that she doesn't want to have sex with, but culturally she's expected to, um, or somebody, uh, gets like very drunk on a date and then has sex with somebody. Uh, and they were like very eager before, uh, before they got drunk versus like one where they weren't eager before they got drunk and then they had sex. And so there's a bunch of like kind of confusing gray area scenarios like that to see what people thought of them. And I'm surprised at what some people call rape, lying about wealth or hobbies in order to get laid. Some people consider that a, a kind of rape. Yeah, that's true. I, I, guess, I guess like a lot of people consider rape to be like under certain conditions, right? Like like it's it's not rape if you um, like have made sort of an explicit contractual agreement with somebody. Um, but if somebody is sort of like lying or like their, their, their side of the agreement is not being honest, then the contract is not valid. And then thus it is some level of rape. Pretending to like a sexual hookup out of fear of disrupting social circles. I wouldn't consider that rape. I would consider that your own foolishness. This is true. <laughs> I would also consider it not rape. Uh, but like a lot of people consider it to be like uh, sort of if you're a dude um, or whoever the the um, the dominant person is, uh, it's like your responsibility to make sure that the other person has no other pressuring incentives on them to have sex with you. It's the same sort of mentality behind like a boss shouldn't have sex with a subordinate because like it's the boss's responsibility to make sure that there's no like undue pressure on the subordinate to have sex with them. But ultimately, I do agree that I do not consider that scenario to be rape. Were women more likely to call things rape than men? Yeah. Yeah, they were. So what did you learn from this survey? I was like surprised by some of it. Uh, it's like, I thought that people were going to rate, rate like, uh, like age gaps is like more rapey than they did, for example. Um, but yeah, I, I was also surprised to learn that women rated things as more rapey than men, but in general, it's just kind of like, it's mostly just individually interesting each individual point. Uh, I don't know if there's like large lessons to be learned. Rapey is now a word. I, guess. I wish there was like a better word to talk about this, but I mean, I was literally studying the word rape. Like I very intentionally used that word. So yeah, that's what I have to use to talk about this. Why in your surveys do you ask questions like, how many passwords do you have? Or have you been audited? <laughs> yeah. I always I had good uh, recollection of why I asked those questions, but usually it's anything I'm curious about, like literally anything. Like I'm just sitting there and like idle thought pops into my head. I'm like, that seems like a cool thing to ask about. Then I just go ask about it because I just want to know. All right. Speaking of idle thoughts, I had a friend, he's passed away now, who used to take sex polls for Playboy. And I found them fascinating. And they were things like, if you could take a trait from the opposite sex to have for yourself, what would you want to take? What would you want to take from men? He asked the women. What would you want to take from women? He'd ask the men. What What do you think people answer? That's so interesting. Uh, like, are we talking about like personality or physical? Either. If you're assuming there are personality differences. I mean, my guess is that men would answer something around like the ease of having sex, like like wanting to be desired in the same way that women are, uh, like ease of access to sex. And my guess is that women would answer uh, something about uh, being taken seriously. Well, those were not big answers. The big answers really? for women was physical size and strength. Women mm -hmm. said, I don't like walking down the street and feeling men can overpower me. Yeah. And for men, it was about 70% said the ability to have multiple orgasms. <laughs> okay. 20% said breasts, that they like them so much, they'd like to have their own to touch. Wow, that's really fascinating. So if you want to ever look this up, uh, Howard Smith is his name. This is right up my alley. Thank you. And finally, uh, my cousin Kenny, who lived with a sex worker for a while, um, asks, is there a correlation between enjoying sex work and your first sexual experiences with people your own age? Hmm. And at what age did you first enjoy sex? And feel free to say it's none of your business. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, the first time I had sex, I was Christian and was horribly guilty about it. So it wasn't fun. I was like, oh, no, I've violated God's laws. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I have to marry you now. Uh, but once I started like having sex for real, I loved it. It was great. Um, 
but yeah, I'm kidding. I could, I could try and, and test this correlation. I have some data so I could go look. Your conservative Christian family, how have they reacted to your telling the truth about what you're doing? Not great. Uh, they're obviously not a fan. Uh, I'm not in contact with my dad anymore, really. Um, and so I don't have to really worry about that. But uh, my mom mostly just pretends that it's fine. She's like, this is something that we don't talk about, uh, which honestly is like kind of nice. Like a lot of very Christian parents will like nix you. Like I have a sex worker friend who just was completely cut off of contact from her parents after they found out she did sex work. So at least I haven't gone through that, which is really nice. Um, but she's definitely really doesn't like it. Uh, she's not going to like that I'm doing this interview right now, for example. Ayla, thank you very much. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Hope you like this video. YouTube's algorithm may not like it and may not show it to a lot of people, but I think it's an important topic. So please share it and like it so more people will get to see it.